Well, we're continuing our lessons on the matter of stewardship. Stewardship, that's a clean word, isn't it? What is involved in stewardship? Well, a great deal. It's so important that people uh, recognize that you're not an island to yourself, that you're a part of a community. When God saves you, you become a part of the corporate body of Christ. And there's a responsibility in John. The Apostle Paul said on the road to Damascus, when he was smitten down and saw a light from heaven brighter than the noonday sun, he cried out and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And every saved person in this auditorium this morning, you ought to cry out, O oh God, what wilt thou have me to do? The words of the Apostle, our, our victories, our successes, contingent upon our willingness. And you young men here from different seminaries, uh, we are delighted you can be here with us today. And you might uh, catch the vision and spirit of how, what is needed to build a great church. We claim the distinction, and records prove this to be true, this is the largest and the oldest church in America that is combined. There's not another church the age of this one, the size of this one, and the entire United States of America. And we have, we have stayed fundamentally strong, fundamentally separate from the liberalism and apostasy of our day. And uh, if I had to put my finger on one thing that's, that I would say has been a success has been because we have stayed with the book, uh, people of the book. And this brings, of course, into focus stewardship. Why is it necessary to give? Just as the Lord could have caused, or our Heavenly Father could have caused the stones to cry out and to praise the Son of God as He rode the donkey into Jerusalem, just as God could have caused the stones to cry out and praise Him, God could have financed His work independently without man if He had so chosen to have done it. To have done it, but he didn't choose to do it that way. God always has a plan, and God's plan is for His people to give. And stewardship is a vital and important part of the Master's work. If God does not have our pocketbook, He doesn't have our hearts. You say, "Well, prove it." All right, He says, "Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." And when we are covetous and we withhold from Him, that means that the curse of God will be upon us. Lesson number three in that book, if you'll turn to page three. Covetousness, the curse of the Christian and of the church today. Now in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, we find these words. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have pierced themselves through with many hurtful lusts and sorrows. You see, my friends, covetousness is a deadly sin. It's like idolatry and witchcraft. That's what it is. Covetousness is idolatry and witchcraft. The love of money is the root of how much evil? All evil. Because money is power. And when we get right down to it, it's like Solomon said, hey, money answereth all things, or money talks. And you see, beloved, your nature and mine, inherently, naturally, is to be selfish. These little kids up here in, the, in this nursery, you don't have to teach them to be selfish. They just naturally are selfish. They like their daddies and mothers. They didn't learn that in a church nursery. They learned it from daddy and mama because they, they were born with this condition existing in their being. And therefore, they have to be taught the opposite. And uh, the opposite, of course, is to give. The natural thing is to keep. The unnatural thing is to give. 
And that's why a man really needs Christ in his heart to be able to give. Now, let's look at these lessons briefly. And in, uh, in this lesson number three, some examples of the fruit of covetousness. In uh, Genesis, uh, Eve saw that the tree was good for food in Genesis 3 and desired to make one wise. And she took and did eat and gave unto her husband and he did eat. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. It's John said in his epistle is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now you see, my friend, that Adam and Eve in the beginning. Now you say, well, God created them. Yes, but you must remember that Adam and Eve was created in innocence. And they were created with the capacity of choice. They were not robots. God pushed a button and they reacted. But they were created in innocence and thereby had the capacity to choose. And strange as it may seem this morning, those of us that's had the second birth have the capacity to choose. Those of you that you have had one birth have the capacity to choose. This is one of the mysteries of God and you'll never understand it until you get to the other side. Now, Baptist have been accused, you know, of a fatalism uh, that uh, God is sovereign and God gives eternal life and, and uh, people have maligned Baptists and saying, well, if I believe once saved, always saved, I'd go out and do anything I wanted to do. That's proof you still have your animal nature because when you get saved, there is a new nature there that will prompt you to do things that's right in the sight of God. And so, my friends, we have here in the beginning a right of choice. And as I said, strange as it may appear to you, God gives all of us the right of choice. And I'm glad he does. I'm, I'm so thankful that God gives to man the privilege of choosing. Well, he did it to Adam and Eve. Now, look in Genesis 13 and Genesis 19. You have it there. And the case of Lot. Now, there came a time when, Adam, uh, when uh, Abram and Lot, Abram was Lot's uncle, and Abram had broken uh, the command of the Lord because the Lord had told Abram to go leave his, leave his kindred in his country, but Abram kept his nephew. You want to watch these things. When God tells you to do something, do it. Don't halfway do it. Let me ask you this morning, is halfway obedience... In other words, let me put it like this. Last Sunday, when it was cold and your car wouldn't start, and you just halfway tried to start it maybe, and you didn't come to church, and you didn't tithe the last Sunday, and so you came today and you tithe, but you didn't tithe from last week. Is, is that right? No, it's not right. Halfway obedience is never right. Halfway right is not right. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Now listen, look up this way a moment. If I've got, if I have truth in this hand and I have error in this hand, well, let's be, let's be humorous about it a little bit. Let's have John Rawlings in this hand and old Herbert W. Armstrong in this hand. <laughs> that's, a, that's something, isn't it? And then we put them together, what would you have? Have a fight, of course, but uh, I'm talking about doctrine now. <laughs> If you have truth in this hand and error in this hand and you put it together, what do you have, brother? You always have error. Did you notice how I said that? You always have error and never truth and error. It's always error. Truth will not mix with error. That's why Paul said to Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth. When I was a kid and my mother was having company... And it seemed like we had more poor relatives than anybody in the country. And they had more kids. Don't let anybody joke you about these Catholics having a lot of kids. The Baptists had a lot of them too. And the Methodists. And uh, mother cooked so many pies. And I'd always watch her cutting up those pies. And it seemed like she, she just kept getting the, that slice of pie smaller and smaller and smaller. 
And if you fellows, now be honest with me, man, when you order dessert in a restaurant, you always look at the size of the pie, the slice. You know what I mean? Well, sure you do. That's human nature. All right, when God starts slicing truth, he slices it down pretty small because he won't let error in with truth. And it gets so narrow sometimes. Doesn't it get narrow? It really does, doesn't it? You say, well, I, I think I'll go ahead, go to my church and my denomination. Listen to me, folks, some of you sitting right here this morning, and you belong to denominations uh, that has given money uh, for an avowed communist, Angela Davis. And you know what the Bible said? In the day that you stood on the other side, you washed as one of them. That's what the prophet said. And God said, come out from among them and be you separate. And God is a great separator. He doesn't mix truth and error. Un-Americanism and Americanism, he doesn't mix them together. I mean, you just can't, you can't, that kind of mix won't mix. Oil and water will not mix. Bitter water and sweet water can't come forth from the same fountain. What am I saying? You're either going to be for God out and out or else you're going to be for the world, the flesh, and the devil. Whose side are you on? Now some folks say, well, I'd join Rawlings Church if he didn't cut it so thin. Son, I'm not trimming it any thinner than God did. That's what he says. Truth is truth. Error is error. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Some people say you ought to be tolerant. That's stupidity. Now I believe, I believe we ought to be understanding about things. I think I have a broad-based, broad-gauged attitude toward the youth of our generation. I spent some time yesterday morning talking to some young men from University of Cincinnati. They are in our Sunday school. They, they've been coming here. One of them was converted here. They want to go into full-time Christian work. You ought to let them tell you some things that they've experienced in the dormitories and at UC and all of this radicalism. Some of the fellows telling me, Men that are avowed communists teaching in our universities. Isn't that something? Man, I'm telling you, it's strange in our day what people put up with and what they tolerate. I get letters all the time. I had a, I had a letter the other day and from an acquaintance of mine. I wouldn't call him a friend. He wanted me to. He wanted me to write an endorsement of a certain project, and I wrote him back. I said, I've always had an, a, a policy that I'm very careful about what I endorse, put my name to it, because I'm going to have to answer for it. I'm pretty careful with my name. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And I'm mighty careful about linking my name up with uh, subversive organizations, Standing with people that stand straddle of the fence and a lot of things like that. So my friend, I'm either for God or I'm against him. And that includes my pocketbook here. That includes my checkbook. I read an article yesterday in a magazine uh, talking about a successful marriage. It said a successful marriage is based upon two books. A cookbook and a checkbook. <laughs> and that's about the truth of it. And then in the paper this morning, I read about the women's liberation movement. And that old gal, uh, we used to shoot things like that when I was a kid in the country hunting. And she's supposed to head that organization. God help her. I guess it's a her. I don't know really what it was. But uh, I, think, I think American women have had it great myself. And uh, they've, I don't think the American women have a lot to complain about. I don't think American people have anything to complain about as far as I'm concerned. God's been better to our country than any nation on the, on the earth today. So you see, gratitude is a great part of all of this. I wonder if, if the Lord Jesus then really has our heart. Lot looked toward the well-watered plains of Jordan and, and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was down there. Now listen, daddies and mamas. Listen, compromisers. And Abraham gave him the choice, and so Abraham said, Now, nephew, which would you take, the, the hill country, or will you take the level land? And old covetous Lot looked at both, and he said, I think 
Uncle Abe, if you don't care, I'll take this over here. And he did. And you know what happened to him? Read the sordid story from Genesis 13 through 19. You'll get it and then on through the book and you find him at at last lying with his two daughters. And uh, you read the story of the tribes that came from that awful page in human history. Wouldn't that be a a debauching thing? You know... Not long ago, a person pointed out a teenage girl in this Sunday school of ours. And uh, that's going to make you cringe, but it'll help some of you. So you go ahead. If you don't like it, uh, you can go somewhere else. But uh, uh, this fellow pointed out a young girl in this Sunday school. He said to me, Reverend Rawlings, he said, you don't know the background. But that girl's father has had illicit relationship with her for the past two and a half to three years. Well, you know what? It makes you almost want to take a gun and go over there and shoot that low-down rascal. Back in the old days, they would, and they wouldn't need a judge or a jury, or they wouldn't need the Civil Liberties Union to help them out at all. they just take care of that. I mean, those of us who are parents, God have mercy. Isn't that terrible? That, my friend, is the base nature of man without God and without hope. And that poor little girl, you look at her expression and drawn and sad and she'll be in a psychiatric ward before she's 25 in all likelihood. Well, covetous lust, lust, did you get it? Lot lusted. And let me tell you people something. Ask me, say to me today, Preacher Rawlings, Uh, Do you have some example of men and women uh, that at one time were all right and sin entered their lives and they got to where they couldn't think straight and things didn't add up? Listen, I can tell you some stories in private where I've had dealings with people at one time, they were all right, and then sin entered their lives. Sin will blind you, it'll cripple you, you can't think plain, straight, you can't think sensibly. Sin has a way of crippling a man mentally and spiritually. Sin is the ruination of the human race. And it ruined Lot because he lusted, he looked, he lusted, and he landed in Sodom and he lost his family. And that's what's going to happen to some of you people. You're going to lose everything because of your sense of values. Lot lost it all. Look at, at Achan in Joshua chapter 7. You read these stories when you get home. Now, Achan lusted after some gold wedges and silver wedges and Babylonian garments. And he took those things and hid them in the center of his tent. And that little old country of Ai just licked the daylights out of Israel when they had been able to uh, march around Jericho and the walls fell flat and they conquered the city. And then they go out here in a short while and, and a few hundred men of Ai were able to conquer them. And Joshua, the leader, fell on his face in prayer. And let me teach you a lesson. I told some preachers in the conference the other day, I said, now gentlemen, you can make out of it all you wish. But let me tell you something. When there's sin in the camp, you're not going to have much power. And you know how you can you know how you can check preachers out? Let me give you let me give you a key. You know how to check a preacher? Check him out how he preaches against sin. Any time a preacher will not preach against sin and will not hit sin like it needs to be hit, it may be that he got some skeletons in the closet. And your attitude towards sin is an indication of what you think about sin. And Paul said sin must become exceeding sinful to us. Now Judas is sorry he got caught when he repented. That's all wrong with them. That godless sorrow that worketh repentance not to be repented of. Now listen. When Achan put that stuff in the tent... Gold wedges, silver wedges, and those Babylonian garments. You know what happened? Israel lost. Israel lost. Men, innocent men, died because someone had sinned. And there's people sitting in this congregation this morning who are suffering because of what others have done. 
Don't kid yourself. God says by the pen of Moses, the sin is visited upon the second, third, and fourth generation. Be sure your sins will find you out. All right then, Achan was bland. He thought he got by with everything. No one's going to pay any attention. God said to Joshua, get up off your knees. No time to pray now. Get rid of that cancer. Cut it out. Get it out. That's why a church today, my friends, uh, that, that's exactly why a church has to be strong. Our sin will come in to cripple that church. You see, the bigger the church, the more people you have, the less likely you are to be able to keep all of the cancerous growths taken care of. You want me to tell you how we handle a lot of the problems around here? This is the way it is. The staff, the men who work with me have ever right in the world to go to people that's not living right and people that's not that's bringing reflection on this church and tell them to either conform or else. And certainly there's a lot of it needs to be done and some have been told that just lately too. And let me tell you something, people. It's not right for you to sit in that pew this morning and be living a double life and crippling the rest of us. It wouldn't be right for Rawlings here in this pulpit to be living a double life and hurting this work and you and your children and grandchildren suffering as a result of it. Let me tell you something, people. You, you're not an island to yourself. And, and this case of Joshua and Achan is an example of it. And the church is a body of believers. And when that corporate body, that church, suffers, somebody may be and will be the cause of it. And you get a crowd of old covetous, non-givers, criticizing, say, well, I'm not going to give my tithe. I'm not going, I, I'll do as I please. And the first thing you know, the Spirit of God, who is a sensitive person, he withdraws his blessing and the church is crippled. Everything that happens to, the, to our family happens to the family. Everything that happens to your family happens to the family. There's not one individual in your family that's separate, that's out yonder by themselves, and what they do is of no concern to the rest of you because what every man does, some of you husbands that drink slop and live in a hog pen, and, and then you've got a lovely family. Let me tell you something, fellas, you do untold damage to your family when you do this. And all the family has to suffer for it. Please learn a lesson today. God help all of us to learn a lesson. You know, as your family, you grow older and your family increases. And like our family, we have grandchildren. I called Sylvia yes, the day before yesterday, I guess, Harold's wife. And Harold, and, of course, is overseas in Israel. And uh, their baby, little Jojo, he's only about 16, 17 months old. I don't know, something like that, 18. Anyway, just learn and talk, say a few words. And I said to Sylvia, I said, put Jojo on the phone. And I heard her say in the background, said it's granddad. Well, man, he's, he said, nandad, nandad, football, football, granddad, football. Man, if he's anybody, he's just like his grandmother. He's crazy about football. But he was really screaming out, you know. And, and I said, Jojo, this is granddad. He said, granddad, football. And I said, where's daddy? He said, daddy. <laughs> that is gone. And he was really enthusiastic about it all. But did you know that whatever happens to granddad will affect Jojo? Whatever happens to Jojo will affect granddad. Let Jojo... Become ill and go to the hospital. Granddad will be going to the hospital. Listen to me now, men and women. Part of the family. Every one of those fingers, part of the hand. The hand's part of the, uh, the, uh, the arm bone. The arm's part of the shoulder. Shoulder, part of the body. 
part of my being. You don't, uh, you don't isolate the finger. We're together. And folks, if you don't learn that early in life, you may cause untold damage to the body. Please, God, help us all. Now, you may be a Christian and a visitor like George here and his friends from Chicago or this young man uh, from uh, the seminary down in Louisville or this young fellow from Pillsbury College up in Minnesota or these other folks visiting with us from Canada, wherever you may be. If you're a Christian, you're a part of the body of Christ. Regardless of color of your skin or the wealth of your bank account or doesn't make a bit of difference. And what Rawlings may do or what you do will affect the body. Aiken, what are you going to do about it? Well, he lied. Finally, whenever they came down from the tribe to the family, you know what they found out? They found out that it was in in Aiken's tent. And you know what? He didn't think it's too bad. He said, well, I just saw some uh, beautiful garments and double-knit suits and, you know, and and a few wedges of gold and silver, and I thought I'd take them, didn't think. There's a whole bunch of it over there, didn't think it amounted to anything. Didn't ever think anybody would pay any attention to it. And yet it caused innocent men to be slain and God's people to be defeated. Wait a minute. You know what happened? A voice of infinitude spoke and said, Take him out, John, in the valley. And his wife and his children and his camels and his oxen, and his sheep, and stone him to death. Well, great day in the morning, if we were to start stoning people today in this auditorium of the Rob God today, we'd have a mass funeral. Covetous? Did you understand what? He didn't go out and get drunk. He wasn't writing literature, engaged in the pornographic traffic of our day, or are selling illicit drugs on the street. All he did was just take some gold and silver and Babylonian garments. And that's all. He didn't do anything bad. He didn't run off with the deacon's wife. He didn't do anything very outstanding. Wonder what you've got hanging in the closet at home. Have you got some Babylonian garments, you reckon? You say, well, that is another day, preacher. That is an olden day. People don't do that. Wait a minute. My Bible tells me the Lord Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord God of Israel changeth not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, you're not consumed. Let me tell you, people, God knows. He's watching. Have you been an honest steward? Have you been an honest steward of God? Do you live right? Give right? Share right, or you're selfish, and taking that, confiscate that which you want, regardless of what it may cost others, and the price that'll have to be paid. I I don't like to say this, but I'm going to say it. What's wrong with America? You know what I think's wrong with America? Covetousness. Give away more, and yet we lust. Now, you know what a businessman said to me last week? We were having lunch together. Said this country and the way it's set up economically, it's training people either to lie legally or illegally. Taxes and this and that and other things, it's about the truth. Oh, God help us this morning, folks. God help us. The older I grow in the master's work, the more I realize the importance of doing that which is right before God. Young couples, please listen to me this morning. Let me give you the formula of successful living. The Lord Jesus Christ must be on the the throne in your heart. He must be in the throne room. He must be the one that is first, or He will not be Lord at all. And when you pray and You say, well, I'm going to do this, Lord, irrespective or regardless of what you think about it. God doesn't like that. God wants to be a part of your life, a vital part. I was telling a man the other day, we were talking about R.G. Letourneau. I was having lunch with some men in construction. I said, I knew Mr. Letourneau quite well. Knew his wife very well because she had a boys' range close to where I organized church. 
And uh, Mr. Letourneau was one of the great Christians of our generation. The fact that he gave so liberally and so generously to the Master's work. He had a great influence on the lives of people. Well, you know, beloved, uh, this has been true. Uh, it's not wrong to have money. Don't get me wrong. I'm trying to set you straight. We've got some little old knot-headed preachers that leave the impression that it's sin to have money. I'm talking about lust. You take some poor people in Cincinnati today are as guilty of the sin of covetousness as people that may have millions. It doesn't mean that you're covetous when you have money. Because I've met some poor people that were extremely covetous. And you know, the man that is lusting and the man who is greedy and the man who is trying to take from others, that man will never have happiness. Because true happiness is found in a life that surrendered to giving. If I were a businessman in this congregation this morning, by all means, I would, I would be careful that God had a major portion of what I have. I can say this today, and please let me use this without any, without any uh, criticism on your part. That all that I have, I've tried to surrender it to Jesus Christ. And I wish I had more to surrender to him. Here sits a businessman, a friend of mine. I've slept in his bed, and I know the dedicated life that he's lived for Jesus Christ. He doesn't have any regrets, still active in the Master's work, and that's true with people of our congregation that have lived lives of surrender and dedication. But the trouble is, most of you out here, you want to do what you want to do, and you're going to do what you want to do, irrespective of what God thinks about it. And that's covetousness. Time is... A, is of essence as much as money and talents. God doesn't give a man talents for him to waste them. He wants that man to use them and to reproduce them and to make them effective. I, uh, one of my fine men, he, this fellow grew up in this church and he'd been hunting. And he, he came last night. I'd had three weddings and he, he's telling, uh, he picked up a kid out here on the expressway and brought him in, and this boy was 16 years old. He was running away, 15 years old, I guess, 16, running away from home. And he was headed for Stanford, Texas. And uh, this fine man, uh, he brought this boy by to talk to the preacher. He was burdened for him, said, I don't know what to do with him. Well, I don't really know. He was going to call the boy's daddy and said the boy, boy ran away from home. And they had expelled him from school because of a minor offense and... and uh, that he was afraid his dad had beat him, and he was on his way to Stanford, Texas. Well, a 15-year-old kid on the highway, they're going to pick him up, and it's, you know, that means they put him in the can and things like that. And so uh, little Harold Nicely works with the youth here and is in maintenance, and he's cleaning up over here. I call, I call little Harold. I said, you talk to him about Jesus. I've got this other wedding, and I don't know how they worked it out, but I thank God for men. Oh, I thank God for men that love others. We have a young couple here this morning. They've got a little boy. I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll uh, be violating anything if I would ask them to stand. You kids stand with you with the little boy. Just stand with him. I want you to see this couple. Stand just a moment. They're trying to be a dad and mother to this boy from a broken home. School won't take him back. We're going to try to get the school because of conditions to happen to him. This young couple, both of them work, is baptized here at our church, live way over in Kentucky. But it came to me, Pastor, we need help. We want to know what to do. Thank you. Thank you, kids. Somebody may ask you, say, well, what makes Landmark great? It's because Landmark has a great heart. Not all of us, but thank God there's some who cares. There's men in this church who will go out yonder and visit and win people to Christ in the down and out and in the slums. We've got, we've got folks here on Friday night who will take buses and go with teenagers 
in the warm weather to the parks and to the and to Fountain Square and preach and hand out tracts and try to win people. Got these boys back here in Dr. Humphrey's class, and they're passing out tracts. And they said to me, said, Preacher, we want to go back to Ironton, Ohio this summer. Said, could you help us? What can we do? I said, you go back up there and mobilize the youth, and we'll hold an open-air meeting in one of the stadiums there. And bless God, we'll try to get the youth mobilized to have a meeting. Listen, folks. It's the nature of love to give. You make up your mind what side of the tracks you're on. Like this young couple want to be a mom and a daddy to this young boy. He needs love. If there's anything America needs today, it needs love. And yet, let me tell you this. You, you, some of you are going to misunderstand. You're going to say, well, Rollins talks about discipline. That's a part of love. You can't really love until you know the meaning of discipline. Do you know that? God, who loved the world, sent his son to die upon a cruel cross and turned his back, and the heavens became black as sackcloth of hair, and he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You don't know anything about love until you know the horrors of hell. Discipline, discipline and love, chastisement of self, You've got to get your life balanced. And a parent uh, that will overindulge their children and not discipline them and help them, that's not a parent at all because you're trying to help them to miss the rough places. And listen, lost people, let me close this morning by saying because I'm a hellfire and brimstone preacher, is evident that I know the truth and I love you and I'm trying to keep you out of hell. And if you go to a church where the preacher never talks about judgment and hell and eternal punishment, he's the greatest enemy of your soul. And the preacher that doesn't believe in the lake of fire and eternal justice and judgment, he doesn't know anything about Calvary. All you need to do, and that's where our folks are today and where Harold is speaking to our people, standing there in the shadow of Mount Calvary. Oh, God help us to go there today. And listen to those cries, alone and helpless, suffering and dying for sinners like you and me. Don't you come to me and tell me that there's not a price to be paid in a sacrifice like that. He didn't swoon upon the cross. He died for sinners. That wonderful Lord and Savior became sin for a wretched human race like you and me. Brother, that's giving. That's what I'm talking about. Songwriter said, if the oceans were ink, and every reed was a quill, and the heavens were parchments, he'd never be able to write the love of God. It's greater far. Than tongue or pen can ever tell. Poor, wretched, unworthy me. And yet he loved me. I listened to all of the lying of the politicians on television and radio. And I listened to the double talk of school officials. And You know what's the matter with them? They don't know anything about the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish America had an old-fashioned dose of honest-to-God honesty. It would be a different world, wouldn't it? Let's stand for prayer. And while we stand with heads bowed, I'd like to ask a question this morning. Would you be honest with God? Oh, would you be honest with God and with self? I said to a fine young man this week, leading him to Christ, I said to him, Son, if you'll be honest with yourself, if you'll be just intellectually honest and face up to the fact that you're a sinner, God will be honest with you. He'll level with you. While heads are bowed, how many in this audience could say this morning, Preacher Rawlings, I may not know too much about the book, but I know one thing, I know I'm saved. I know that. Lift your hand if you can see. I know I'm saved. Thank you. God love you for that testimony. 
means a great deal to stand in God's house and lift that hand and say, I know I'm saved. Well, for those of you that couldn't do it, I want to pray for you. I'd like you to have a part in this prayer. Not going to embarrass you. People have their heads bowed and they're praying. As I look over this audience, every one of you that could not lift your hand and say, I know I'm saved. I want you to lift it now and have a part in this prayer. Come on, lift your hand. Come on, that's all I ask you to do. God love you, that's it. Lift your hand. Come on. If I don't see your hand, the Lord will. Come on, lift your hand. God love you. God love you over here. Someone else, slip up your hand. Someone else, we'll wait a moment. You're saying with the upraised hand, Pastor Rawlings, pray for me. Remember me in a moment of prayer. Someone else? Someone else. There's some people here today, no doubt, that you're having second thoughts about your church membership. We'll receive members by letter, statement, or baptism. You'll have to let us decide how you need to come. It's no problem. We'll pray with you, talk with you about it, and counsel with you. And if you need to come, perhaps you've been saved at home or in the hospitals, you need to come to publicly acknowledge your faith in the Lord. That is, come forward and Secretaries will take your name. You can follow the Lord in baptism because the Lord was baptized and he said it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Baptism is a righteous act of the declaration of your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray now the Holy Spirit will brood over this audience this morning and, oh God, help us to flee from that awful sin that damned the lives of of those that we've studied about this morning and blighted them and wrecked them, men like Achan and Lot and Gehazi, Nahab, all these that presumed that they could get by with a covetous, lustful heart. Oh God, today may there be some strong decisions made as we stand Humble in thy presence for Christ's sake. Amen. Looking this way now as the choir singing, it's invitation time, and I want you to get up out of your seat and come. If there's a heart hunger, if there's a will in your heart to come forward today, there's a voice that's speaking. In